difficult to analyse the Qatar Grand Prix without beginning with the tyre situation, so I'll do that as concisely as I can. After the sprint race, Pirelli analysed the tyres again to see whether or not they were still being affected by the kerbs, particularly in, in turns 12 and 13. Because of the safety car in, in, in interventions, there were three in the sprint race, they didn't really have very good data, but there were signs of this potential problem still existing. So they then went into a regime for the Grand Prix proper, which was that no car could run more than 18 laps on one set of tyres. Still the same rule, you had to run at least two compounds, but you couldn't run more than 18 laps on one set of tyres. That effectively meant it was three pit stop race for everybody. And I think quite a few people said, yeah, great, this is good, this is what we want. Three pit stops, let's go for it. It's gonna be a race, it'll be a mini sprint between each stint, between each stop. And if you want to really go back to the cause of this, I think, again, it's quite superficially easy to say, well, Pirelli, typical, they should have made better tyres. If only the tyres were stronger, it's a disgrace. I think quite a few people are saying that. To me, this is a classic example, a classic result of Formula One staging as many Grand Prix as it can physically squeeze into one year, because that is the main source of revenue for Formula One today. And that includes going to circuits, which perhaps aren't absolutely up to the Formula One standard that we see at other venues. Yes, I know that other racetracks do stage MotoGP races and they get away with it, but Qatar particularly was effectively a motorcycle circuit from day one. So that is why I think they have more problem with the curbs here. And so this is a function of post the big tobacco advertising era, Formula One now realizing that the biggest source of income is just staging as many races as possible. Now there are forces against that of course, it's tiring for the mechanics, it's exhausting for the teams, but that is where the revenue in bulk comes from, from TV revenue and from race promotion revenue. And that is why we're at Qatar. And so you can't really blame Pirelli for this. This is ultimately the situation, this is the business model of Formula One that is the background to this. Anyway, I just wanted to make that point because I don't think it's fair to blame Pirelli as such. For them to build a tyre that's perfect for every circuit, bearing in mind we're going from Monaco to, say, Qatar as two extremes, uh, and Silverstone, I suppose you can throw in there as well, a very, very tall order to do that as efficiently and cost-effectively as possible. Anyway, I've said that. The next point, of course, is mandatory, effectively man three mandatory pit stops in the Grand Prix. No driver could do more than 18 laps on one set of tyres. That took the race advantage a little bit away from Max Verstappen and Red Bull because, of course, what they do have with that great RB19 is the ability, with Max's driving, as well to extend the stint to manage the tires perhaps better than any other team mclaren we know on that hard range of pirelli compounds that we had here in in qatar good job too it was unbelievably hot have been very very quick their car is probably better suited to this hard compound range than any other including the red bull and so it was going to be i think this suddenly opened the race right up particularly for mclaren possibly for mercedes who had qualified second and third mclaren's qualifying remember happened on friday punctuated hurt by driver errors from both oscar piastri and lando norris oscar you can kind of forgive because he was a rookie but lando <laughs> you know, um, didn't need all those deletions from track limit problems. But anyway, this was a boost, I think, for McLaren and Mercedes going into the Grand Prix. And it was going to be interesting always to see how Red Bull and Max Verstappen handled the race. And whereas you had the McLarens coming in lap 13 in the case of Oscar, lap 14 in the case of Lando, it was lap 18 when Max Verstappen came in. And on lap 17, he was still the fastest guy on the circuit. So very, very impressive performance. From that, he was able to build up a margin. It got pretty close towards the end, partly because the McLaren pit work was brilliant, partly because Red Bull's last stop for Max was a couple of seconds over, the, uh, over their normal average but mainly because McLaren chose to run medium, 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 hard, and Red Bull, medium, medium, hard, medium. So McLaren gained quite a lot in that third stint on medium tyres to Max's run on the hard tyre. Max had it all under control, of course, but by the time he came out from that last pit stop with six laps to go on a brand new set of medium tyres, he's only 3.7 seconds ahead of Oscar Piastri, and, and Lando Norris was only two seconds behind Oscar, and, and trying to get the McLaren team to let them race as well, would you believe? Uh, so very, very good performance from McLaren. No surprise, as predicted going into this race on our live stream, McLaren was also always gonna be very, very good around Qatar. But a superb performance from Red Bull, I think, on the day 
with all the championships won, with all the celebrations from the sprint race, from the world championship being achieved by Max yesterday, still they reached down deep and managed to get this race result. So brilliant performance in them. Excellent drive too from Oscar Piastri. It's difficult to, to keep remembering that this guy is a rookie. Calm head, very, very fit, very tough races. You've got Fernando Alonso calling for, as I say, calling for water in the cockpit. And you've got many other drivers lifting the visor. Logan Sargent couldn't finish the race, illness. I'm not sure if that was heat related. We'll have to find out later on. But best wishes to him for a speedy recovery. So excellent performance from Oscar Piastri. And Lando Norris had to be content yet again with being beaten by Oscar. So Oscar took the pole for the sprint, won the sprint. And Lando Norris uh, on the podium, but of course, this will really hurt him again to see how well Oscar's going on a circuit he'd never been to before as well. Oscar Piastri, absolute star. As is Max Verstappen, you know, what a job he did. Where was Sergio Perez all day? He was getting umpteen penalties for going over track limits. He started from the pit lane because the shunt he had yesterday, which I have to say was not his fault at all. It was Esteban Ocon's fault. Um, it required a new chassis. And because of all the changes that had to be made, they infringed the Parc Ferme situation and he had to start from the pit lane. But it really didn't make any difference to, to the race structure at all. Uh, but then the next big thing, the next big thing, and some of you might already have advanced the video to this point, was the first corner. George Russell and Lewis Hamilton. Shades of Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg at Barcelona. And this was, well, this was not George's fault, which I suppose is my way of saying it's Lewis's fault. I think it was Lewis's fault. I mean, he went for, he was, I mean, let's make it clear. He started on the soft tyres. He was on the soft tyres. George was on the medium tyres. And as we saw yesterday in the sprint race, there was a huge advantage off the line to be on soft tyres. Lewis knew that he was probably only going to have a grip advantage for probably four to five laps, which is why on the formation lap, he was saying, I'm just going to get eaten alive by these guys. I think he meant after four or five laps. And so in his head, he was thinking, if I'm going to take any advantage at all from being on this soft tyre, it's going to be in the first couple of laps, maybe even the first corner around the outside. That's probably what he was thinking. I guess Mercedes were also thinking split the options because potentially there might be a couple of safety cars like the sprint, as they were in the sprint race. And maybe if that's the case, Lewis can get more out of that soft tyre, maybe even do a, I don't know, 15, 16 lap opening stint on the soft tyre and maybe pick up uh, some good track position, maybe even get the lead on that soft tyre. But this comes back. This comes back. It's a much deeper thing. This comes back right back to the choice of George Russell as the other driver in the Mercedes. Because in this situation, when you've got Lewis Hamilton, who's never going to be anything other than the seven times world champion who wants to win a Grand Prix if the car is capable of letting him win it. If you've got Lewis in that car, you definitely need to have somebody like a Valtteri Bottas or a Sergio Perez in the other car if you're going to have them next to one another on the grid, which they were P2, P3, and you're going to put one of them, i.e. the guy in P3, on soft tyres and the other guy on medium. Because what you would then need to do, what Lewis would need to do is before the race, they would need to say to the other driver, look, Lewis is on the soft tyre. He may well try something on the outside. If he makes a good start, he'd be on the outside. So whatever you do, say on the inside and make sure that you two do not touch one another. Now, you could have said that to a Valtteri. You could have said that to a Sergio Perez. You could say that to a Carlos Sainz, probably, if uh, if he was in a Mercedes and Lewis was the other driver. But you can't say it to a George Russell. George Russell's too much of a racer. He's, he's a proven winner already. There is absolutely no way in the world that George Russell would have accepted that. And that's why, presumably, they never said anything to him. Because after the incident, after they touched, and by the time George was back in the race, from his pit stop, new new tyres on the car, making up ground, a race ahead, maximum he was ever going to do was finish fourth. George said, I just didn't see it. I didn't see him there at all. I was just concentrating on, on Max and down the inside. So there you have it. That accident was a straight result of choosing to have a driver, an aggressive, fast racer like George Russell in the other car. As I keep saying, just imagine if Mercedes were in the running for the World Championship in any given situation, in any given year. Imagine what it would be like between Lewis and George, and George Russell. The, the management have absolutely no control over them now and there is nothing they can do about it because there is no way you can ever say to George Russell, Lewis may well try to pass you on the outside, let him go. It's never going to happen. It's not a conversation that George would even even begin to listen to. 
And that, of course, is what Mercedes never considered, I guess, when they hired George rather than keeping Valtteri Bottas. So what happened? Lewis went very good start, as he would. I'm not sure why he didn't just make it very, very clear that he was going to be way on the left and try to get George's attention, sort of, before he made that move. But you could see him sort of eyeing up what he was going to do on that grip level, uh, on the soft tyre. He was, he, of course, he, he could have made the corner. There's no way Lewis's judgment was poor. It's just that he never imagined that George wouldn't suddenly move to the right and let him go. But that needed the conversation, Lewis. I'm sorry, you know, there is no way in the world George was going to do that. And so that's why it happened. Lewis clipped George's car, punctured the tyre, and that was it, off into the boonies. And Fernando also had a bit of a moment avoiding it all, allowing Oscar Piastri to come through and take second place by Max Verstappen. Max, of course, made a great start from the pole. And Oscar Piastri suddenly up to P2. The worst nightmare, if, if you like, for, for Red Bull. I love the description Oscar gave it afterwards. Oh, it's nice to see them all getting bowled over on the first corner. Nice to have a cricket analogy. Very, very good. Um, yeah, and he made good use of that. The pressure was always there. The pressure was always there. Max, Max never had a moment when he could relax. He did set fastest lap in the end on that new set of mediums. And, but it was close. It was really close. And, uh, and I think... I think Red Bull can say, yeah, part of that is the whole Pirelli thing and how well the McLarens go on this hard tyre. Part of it, of course, is how good Oscar Piastri is. George Russell finished fourth. Very good drive. Very good drive from George Russell, I thought, uh, after that incident in the first corner. Uh, when he came into the pits, he just thought it's all over for him. Maybe he's going to do one more lap. Just changed the tyres and drove through the field to finish fourth. Really good in traffic. And a tough race for him too, a very hard race. To some extent helped by the regulation, by this format of having to make these uh, mandatory pit stops because it allowed him to refresh and reboot and race the thing as hard as he possibly could. So really, really hard tough day for George Russell but to finish P4 very impressive I thought Charles Leclerc fifth in the Ferrari kind of as we predicted this was never going to be a good circuit for Ferrari it doesn't have any of the things that Ferrari do well and it was a lone performance from him um, very disappointing really to get blown away by George after the, after the incidents he had fair enough they got beaten by McLaren but he shouldn't have got beaten by George not a good day for Ferrari at all even worse when one hour before the race Ferrari announced that Carlos Sainz wouldn't be starting due to what they call a fuel system problem now um I, yeah this is a 2023 super complicated unbelievably sophisticated grand prix car fuel system problem couldn't be fixed carlos Sainz out of the grand prix unable to start i mean that hasn't happened for a long time and of course i do come well i've been around in formula one for long enough uh, to remember occasions when fuel pressure problems, fuel metering unit problems, all these things have been solved on the grid and the car got off. It seemed bizarre to me that an hour before the race, they said, no, nah, can't fix this, impossible. I can only assume it was something to do with having to get the bag tank out of the car or something horrendous like that. So um, a great shame for Ferrari only to have one car and, and, only, and for Carlos Sainz to be taking part in the pre-race festivities with a polo shirt tucked into his race suit not looking very happy as you can imagine because this this could have been a reasonable day for Carlos Sainz he might have beaten Charles Leclerc who knows and Fernando Alonso was P6 in the Aston Martin nothing like as quick as the McLarens or the Mercedes a surprise really after what we saw early on Friday and Fernando had his fair share of moments as well running wide one point having a massive oversteer this this very aggressive initial turn in that Fernando has the characteristics he's had throughout his career didn't serve him particularly well to night in Qatar because it set up an instant oversteer that he was having to control almost the, before he'd even begun to get anywhere near the corner. Footwork and handwork were definitely, um, you know, absolutely flat out for Fernando Alonso. No surprise that he was feeling the heat as much as anyone, perhaps even more, because he was working unbelievably hard in the cockpit um, with that style that he has. Esteban Ocon, very good seventh for Alpine. He was there all day, aggressive, after that incident yesterday in the sprint race. P8 and P10 for Alfa Romeo, Valtteri Bottas and Guan Yajou. Guan Yajou was out of sequence with the pit stops and quite often was running second or third when he was just about to make his own pit stop. Right up there and eventually finished 10th in the points and Valtteri was very quick. He had about the best selection of tyres available for this three pit stop race in terms of having new sets all the time. So a yeah, very, very good weekend for Alfa after some very 
bad weekends. And Sergio Perez eventually finished ninth. As I say, two penalties for track limits, just not good enough really for a driver in, in that Red Bull. But having said that, you know, what a Red Bull need in the other car. He's been a part of this Constructors' Championship and in and he's never going to do, I don't think, he's never going to do into the first corner to Max what we saw between Lewis and George. It's not going to happen with Sergio Perez and, and Max Verstappen. If they start them on different rubber like that, there's no way Jonathan Wheatley or Christian Horner wouldn't be saying to Perez, be ready for Max to pass you on the outside, stay out of the way. And that's what you need with the team. I'm not saying you want a number two who's slow. I'm just saying you need a driver who is compliant and can work with the star driver you've got, whether it's Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, George Russell, a star in his own right, Oscar Piastri, for sure, Charles Leclerc. And that's the problem. Um, you don't have um, you don't have that at, at Mercedes. It's an absolute bun fight. And we saw that today. And it won't be the last time that sort of thing will happen either. In the green room before the podium, it was interesting to see Oscar Piastri just collapse onto the floor and just spend the entire period lying on the floor there, getting his body temperature down and just basically, wow, you know, he was absolutely shattered. Lando and Max sitting in their movie director's chairs as normal, but Oscar absolutely prone on the ground. Reminded me of uh, a 1992 San Marino Grand Prix when I was lucky enough to be on the podium representing Williams. We finished one, two, Nigel and Ricardo Patrese. And I went into what was effectively the green room then, and Ayrton, who'd finished third, was lying in exactly the same way as Oscar Piastri, absolutely shattered, just lying on the ground. I went up to him, I said, Ayrton, are you okay? And he could barely speak. He said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm okay, just leave me. And he was same, really, probably worse than I think, because um, I think driver fitness and physio work is obviously better now than it was back in, in 1992. But that was the first time I've seen that since Ayrton in, uh, at Imola in, in 92 after that race. Oscar, yeah, what a, what a star. Max Verstappen, what a star. Lando, great racing driver. I mean, he's got a great smile, hasn't he? And he's, and he's really good after the race. And he's really good at acknowledging his own shortcomings or, or mistakes anyway, and as was Oscar Piastri. I mean, for him to have been on the pole, won the sprint race and finished second in the Grand Prix, to be saying, as he's coming towards the, the pits, to come into the pits to Park Ferme, to be saying, I'm so sorry I let you guys down on Friday, referring to Friday qualifying. <laughs> you know, not many young kids would do that, let alone any racing drivers, actually. Uh, very, very impressive to see that. Very impressive to see Max and Oscar racing. So there we are. Yeah, Qatar. Uh, what a weekend. More live streams coming up, of course. Looking forward to those. In the meantime, big thanks to Jetcraft, to Pitbox.io, and of course to you. See you soon.